Today on Portable Magic, we're talking to an amazing writer who has written over 70 books for children, for young adults, and for adults. She was born in Indonesia of French parents and brought up in France and Australia. She's an award-winning author. She's also been awarded an AM, member of the General Division of the Order of Australia. Have you guessed who it is yet? It's Sophie Masson. So Sophie, it is so lovely to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for inviting me, Sue. Very pleased to be here. Sophie, obviously as a child, you really moved around a lot. What role did books play in that ever-shifting world between countries for you? Oh, they were super important um, because, you know, we lived yeah, in a world where we were constantly going backwards and forwards. We had a foot in both in the French world and the Australian world. My parents didn't emigrate. They were expatriate workers who just happened to stay in Australia a long time because the contract kept being renewed. But then before that, they lived in Indonesia, where I was born, Africa, et cetera. So a lot of globe trotting, a lot of um, changes of things. And sometimes I sort of say, that's why I got attracted to writing about, um, you know, journeying between worlds, because that was what we did. It was just our life. And books were really important because... Um, they were an escape um, from, you know, there are, it's what a lot of people think it's wonderful to be between two worlds and to be going around. And it is, a lot of the time it is. But there's also a lot of confusions and, and things that you have to cope with um, when you're between languages, between worlds, between countries, etc. And books sort of provide, um, and stories just provide an escape and, and a way of going into totally other, different places, different worlds, different people. Um, and also they were, they were also, you know, we, my parents didn't, wouldn't have TV and they, um, so we, we had to in, basically entertain ourselves, come from a big family. And, um, so I used to, to, you know, because I read so much and I knew so many stories, so I used to make up a lot of my own and tell them to my brothers and sisters and make up little books. And so that, you know, Stories and books were incredibly important to me, um, both as an escape and as a way, actually, of finding my place in the world. And also, it sounds connecting with your siblings as well as building a relationship yeah. with them. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we're all still very close. And um, we had a bit of a, um, a, not a strange upbringing, but we had an unusual upbringing, let's say, because... Like I, I got really sick as a child and was sent back to my, uh, as a baby, as I said, back to my grandmother in France. And I was with her for four years while my parents were in Indonesia. And so I didn't see them at all during that time, you know, which is quite a formative period for a child. My family then was my grandmother and my two aunts. And then they came back and we came to Australia. And then my two older sisters stayed in France too because they were going to boarding school. They're quite a bit older, you know, seven and five years older than me. And so the family kind of, there was kind of all these permutations that some of us were staying with my grandmother, some of us were with my parents. And, um, but we were all really close and possibly because of those experiences as well. So you form these bonds, you know, um, which are, are, are still very, very strong, even though we're still scattered around the world. <laughs> I'm not surprised. So <laughs> with those... Um, I guess themes, you know how they say our first books are autobiographical and our books continue to reflect part of our lives. Do you think those themes of relationships over time and space have continued on through your books? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's very interesting you say that because, you know, one of the things I've always thought is um, my first book, I... Um, you know, I didn't want to write about my life. So my first book was The House in the Rainforest, which is an adult novel, which is set on the north coast of New South Wales at a period of change, you know, in the 1970s. And then I had a children's book came out in the same year, a couple of months later, called Fire in the Sky, which was set in um, also in the country, but in Northern Tablelands and was a fantasy novel. Now, I would have thought, OK, those things didn't really have connection to what, and I deliberately sort of did it because I didn't want to do the sort of migrant story, you know. Um, but in fact, as you say, those themes are there, you know, they're really important. And the themes of families over time, of the relationships also with the past, because we were brought up um, 
with a very strong understanding of our ancestors as well. So um, we had a lot of documentation going all the way back to the um, 16th century. And so we knew people's names, what they did, and all that sort of stuff. So those, all that stuff has always been very important to me. But, you know, until you just said it, then I just thought, oh, yes, of course, <laughs> that's what it is. So there you go. You discover something all the time. And I think it is that um, looking back to at the time, you don't realise it's, and it will be someone else who says to you, oh, I can see this. And you go, oh, mm. I did not know I did that. <laughs> That's so, right. So for you started as an adult writer, then you went to children's, and I know you write across all genres now, including short story. How did you avoid getting uh, pigeonholed, I guess? Because sometimes you hear of people going, right, I'm a, ch a children's writer and I can't write adults. How did you avoid that? I guess I, I've i never really taken much notice of people categorising you, so, which is extremely naive, I suppose. But um, I just it was just the story that suggested itself. I knew what it would be. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't... So, for instance, I didn't think also of writing young adult um, literature until, um, well, my book, The House in the Rainforest, the adult novel, came out. And um, uh, during, soon after, the young adult editor from UQP, who published the book, wrote to the wonderful Barbara Kerr Wilson. She wrote to me and she said, you have a wonderful voice because the, the book starts in the voice of a 16-year-old girl. Um, and then, you know, it goes through her adult years and stuff. But she said, you have a wonderful, you have really got the voice of a 16-year-old really well there. Have you ever thought of writing young adult literature? And I said, actually, I've got this idea for a story, but and I couldn't work out where it would fit. And I told her about it, and she said, oh, it's a young adult novel for sure. And I wrote it, and that was a novel called Sooner or Later. And so, you know, it's really, I don't always know what the, the book is, so... Possibly that's why I don't get pigeonholed because every story is so different and everything seems to... And look, I've been very fortunate that people have been happy to accept um, what I do. I have had a couple of experiences with um, pen names and one in particular, which was Isabel Merlin, was very particular sorts of books. And I did enjoy that too. Um, and that was especially so that these particular books wouldn't be... Um, put in the same, you know, if you think, okay, you're going to read a Sophie Masson book, you know, it's going to be like this and this. Although I don't think that most people could actually find a, a really good category to put it in. But um, with Isabel Merlin, there were very particular kinds of books. And it was interesting because I did get a different audience for those than I did, and they were young adult novels. I did get a different kind of young adult audience than I did with my other young adult books. So you know, it's it's a it's a very interesting thing, isn't it? Um, but I have been fortunate in that I haven't had um, publishers or my agent telling me you must always stay in this particular category or the other. Mm -hmm. They they know that it's impossible to repress <laughs> what I do. So I think probably they they've just given up. You know, so yeah. So for you said stories come to you. How, how do they come to you? Is it a question? Is it a flash? How do you know you've got something that you've got to write? Yeah, it, it's, that's an interesting question too because they do come in so many different ways. So um, sometimes it is just a flash. Sometimes just a thing of, I wonder what if this and that happened? I mean, every writer asks, what if, you know, what if this happened? What if that happened? Sometimes they're based on family experiences, but, you know, transformed. Um, or on things that I've heard or read about. Um, sometimes, uh, very occasionally, they've come out of a dream. Um, and sometimes those ones work extremely well. Like I've got a picture book called The Snowman's Wish, which has just come out the last couple of months. And that came directly out of a dream. And it was the most extraordinary thing because it just, I could see the scene and I could hear this. It's the snowman speaking to me. And when I woke up, I had the the first two lines were just totally imprinted in my head, wow. sat down, wrote it, and it just wrote itself almost. And it, and even as it went through the editing process, it hardly had to be changed at all. The publisher just said, this is a fantastic text that doesn't really need changing. And so that was came out of a dream, but that 
And I've had a few books like that that have come out, at least partly, out of a very particular striking scene. But most, that is very rare. Um, other times, you know, you have things like, for instance, my, I've got a book called The Hunt for Ned Kelly, which has been very popular, and I won the Premier's, New South Wales Premier's Literary Award for it. And it sells and sells and sells, you know. Crime doesn't pay unless you write about it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I had always been fascinated by Ned Kelly, even as a child. Um, and by basically, I had not thought about writing about him because there's so much about him, of course. And then one day, you know, a whole lot of things came together that I had been thinking about that I had seen over many years. And the book just came together in the most amazing way. But that was because, you know, I'd had like 25 years of thinking about it without knowing that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, but sometimes it's just literally something I've seen in a newspaper headline and I think, oh, you know, what if that, what if that was like this and like this? And how does this work? You know, so it's, and occasionally publishers have asked me, you know, um, will you write something that's set like my, my book, um, War and Resistance, is set in the Second World War? Um, and, you know, so I'm not sort of constrained by what I can write about, but I have got a kind of framework, a kind of setting, and the story comes out of that. When do you know, like, apart from when the publisher says, can you write, when do you know what it's going to be? Almost as soon as you start to write it. It may be that while you're thinking about it, because I do quite a lot of thinking about, about the books, you know, the stories beforehand, it may be that you're not sure, and it's just the act of writing, you know, oh, yeah, this is what it is, for sure, you know? Um, and that happens very quickly. Um, so, because, you know, you're sort of being, I guess, I always think, you know, when you're writing, there's a kind of a, a little trap door that opens in your mind, which is normally shut, and you can call it the subconscious or call it whatever you want, but it is that, and the very act of sitting at the computer with a keyboard sort of opens that trapdoor and then thing, the, th the thing that has been, been working away in the background that you haven't been aware of is suddenly there and you know what it is. Mm. Um, that's a sort of very mm. metaphorical way of looking at it, but it, it, that's what it feels like. Um, whereas I may not have known while I was making notes, while I was thinking about it, because that's a different kind of process. Are you a planner? Do you do a lot of planning or are you a pantser? I'm a pantser basically, <laughs> but I do have some things very clear in my mind. So um, I know where I want to end up, for instance. I know um, the beginning. And, but in between, it's like I just I often tell kids um, when I'm in school visits and stuff, it's like when you go on a holiday, you might have booked the first night and you know where you want to end up. Um, but in between, let's go on an adventure and see what happens, you know? And that's pretty much how I work. Um, but like I said, because there's things happening in your subconscious that you're not really aware of, probably there's planning going on there at that level and you're not aware of it until you actually sit down and write. Um, but yeah, I am basically a panther, but with those sort of delineations as well. As well as your writing, you are what I would call a passionate advocate for writers and for writing. How important has that been um, to balance that with your writing? You know, being chair of the New England Writers' Centre and you are um, part of the Small Press Network. How That's important right. are those roles? Well, they're really important. I, I feel that, look, I've been extremely fortunate in my career. Um, I have had wonderful um, publishers, a wonderful agent. I've had a lot of luck with a lot of things and I've been continuously published, you know, for 30 years now. Um, and I just felt like about um, oh, 10 years ago, I guess, when my, my children had grown up and left home and I thought this, it's time now for me to give back to the writing community because I've also had a lot of support and, and very generous sort of help from other writers, when I was starting out, um, I had fantastic feedback from very eminent um, writers who, to whom I wrote as a little newbie, you know, um, who were very kind and, and very, very helpful. 
and I and it really sort of helped to boost my confidence, you know. And so I felt um, also, you know, as as the more and more you know about the industry and about the circumstances in we, which we all have to operate, um, the more you realise that it's really important that um, writers um, have a common purpose and have a common a unity. Um, and so, you know, I, I've been a member of, for instance, the Australian Society of Authors for a very long time. And I was the chair for three years at one stage as well, as well as being on the board for a little while. And that was really important because the, the you know, bodies like the ASA and the Writers' Centre and the Small Press Network, they really try to help their members um, in very practical ways. So it's not just about moral support, it's about practical things. So for instance, the Australian Society of Authors, um, we are very grateful to them for the fact that they campaign for lending rights, which has been, and for me as an individual author, it's a huge part of my income. It's a very important part of my income. And, um, you know, lots of other things that, that, that they've done, you know, set up the copyright agency, do all these things. And similarly with the Writers' Centre, you know, there's all these courses, all these opportunities that are provided um, for people and with a small press network for small publishers who, you know, don't have the same ballpark as the big publishers at all. I mean, many of them are creators themselves who've started up small enterprises. So it's really important, I think, to get involved. Not everyone wants to be on a board or to, to do that sort of thing, and, and that's not necessary. But I think to support these organisations, to be part of them, and not to think, oh, well, that's not for me, I'm fine, you know. Um, you might be fine, but other people may not be. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really important that we keep supporting those organisations. Um, and I felt, look, by the stage that my children had left home, I had a bit, little bit more time to do that. I know that very often people say, well, why aren't there more younger people on the boards and stuff? But that's for that reason, you know. <laughs> the time, you're very time poor when you have little kids and, and even teenagers. So um, over, you said you've been writing 30 years. So over that 30 years, what has been the biggest challenge for you in all the changes that you've seen? Because I know for me, oh gosh, I think it's 20 years. And I go, wow, the things that have changed in that time. So for you, what's been your biggest things you've had to get your head around in that 30 years? Well, uh, there's so many changes, isn't there, all the time. And it's not like, I think at the moment, it looks like there's huge changes in the publishing industry. But when you look back, it's always been the case. There's always been, it's one of those unusual industries that mixes arts and business. And so therefore, um, things sometimes don't quite correlate, you know. Um, but I think it's it's an extraordinary industry too. It's a wonderful industry to be in. I think one of the things for me that has changed enormously and which I do find a little bit difficult is that, um, and it's more to do with the demise of newspapers and the press and so on. I think that, you know, when I, um, you know, when I was starting out and even um, right up until, you know, I don't know, 15, 10 years ago even, even a, a writer could supplement their writing um, or the creative writing, you know, novels and poetry and what have you, with um, freelance pieces for magazines and newspapers. Uh, and in fact, I built up my career at the beginning from that because I had to have a little bit of income. And um, my husband was also, he was doing, um, you know, he was doing university as, as an external student, as was I. And so we had, um, we, we had to try and fit in a whole lot of things. And I worked as a journalist for a while, but then, you know, I, I couldn't because we moved to a different area. And so I was sending off a lot of freelance things. And that really helped in building up that thing, but also building up your record, you know, as, as a writer, as a name. So in children's writing, that's been different because the school magazine has continued to go on and stuff like that. And it really supports, you know, children's writers and illustrators to build a career. But I, th I feel really sorry for a lot of writers, young writers now, they don't have that extra thing. And okay, there's blogs, there's websites, there's wonderful things like that, and they're fantastic, but they don't pay you unless you're very lucky. Hand in hand with that is also the fact that um, reviews pages have been compressed so much. It's so difficult. Yes, there's very good online sites, but they don't have the coverage that 
you know, I mean, you might have the coverage in Goodreads, but it's, uh, it can be a sort of double-edged sword, Goodreads, and <laughs> um, <laughs> to say the least. Um, so there's, and there's lots of really good blogs, people running fantastic review blogs, and there's still a few, and like I said, like in children's literature, that's one of the only areas where it still remains, where there's a prominent, you know, children's literature magazine that still exists, which is Magpie's magazine. But that's difficult because to get your book noticed is harder. Um, and as we know, in the online environment, you know, there's so much going on. Um, and um, it's really hard to, uh, for both for authors and publishers to pierce through. So I think those are big challenges. And the fact that authors have to work so much harder now to publicize and promote their books um, you know, I mean, look, I quite enjoy doing some of that stuff, but I, I wouldn't, you know, sometimes I sort of feel, oh, dear, no, I don't want to do that, you know. Um, you know, whereas before, there used to be a lot more input um, from the publisher who could contact the press, you know, and, and so on. So it's, uh, I think those are the things. The fact that it's difficult to earn a living from other kinds of writing now, which might help to support your career, especially at the beginning. Um, and the fact that the review space has become so contested and difficult. Um, yeah, I think those are the things because everything else, there's always problems, you know, with <laughs> whether you're going to get a, a good advance or not, whether what your royalties are going to be like, all those things have always existed. And uh, I don't think they're any worse now than they ever were. But I think the the piercing through, you know, the, the marketing is really hard and the extra money. I mean, you can do things like school visits and all that sort of stuff, although at the moment, of course, that's a bit difficult, except virtually. Um, but I think those are things that I would say have changed the most. And it really is to do with the catastrophe, if you like, really, that has befallen newspapers. Yeah. Yeah. Just to finish up, you have just released A House of Mud and, of course, A Snowman's Wish. Congratulations on those. Thank what you. are you working on now? Yes, well, I'm working on a couple of things. And one is an adult novel and one is a children's novel. <laughs> so um, the children's novel is actually a sequel to a book of mine, which is coming in September, which is a, a little chapter book called Four on the Run, which is about four little vintage machines that decide to run away when they think they're going to go to the scrapyard. And it's kind of an... A, a version of the four musicians of Bremen, but with the characters being little cars and motorbikes instead. And so I'm writing a sequel to that called Fall at Sea, where they get shipwrecked on this desert island. It's a lot of very silly fun. It is just like the greatest fun to write because you really don't can't get gloomy writing this sort of <laughs> book. Uh, it's completely ridiculous fun. Um, but the other one is, is a novel, um, which is um, a novel which is based really very much around sibling relationships and stuff and, and around a very beloved house as well. So it's, um, it's a really fantastic book to write as well. And I'm really enjoying doing that and looking up things about, you know, you can choose the, the wonderful house that's big, you know. I mean, it's just lo lovely. Um, but it's also quite... Um, you know, you have to delve quite deeply into it. So it's obviously based, you know, as well on some of my, it, they're, not, they're not my siblings at all, but obviously on some of the relationships um, that we have within the family. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's, they're both really fantastic things to write, but I'm really at the very early stage with both of them. Dr. Sophie Masson. A.M. Yes. Thank you so much for talking to us today. <laughs> I could talk all day, but I'm, I know, you know, you've got things to do and I don't want to hold you up too long. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much, Sue. It was a great pleasure.